our next speaker needs no introduction. Nevertheless, I'll just you know, re-mention that he was the student of Henry. So Justice Kabub knows that I have great uh, disagreement with him over uh, dividend policy, which I think should be under the business judgment rule, no exceptions. So there is a paper which I co-authored with Asaf Hamdani, which is about to be published in the Yale Law Journal, and there we explained why. So I hope we will have some influence over your views over that. Okay, so back to the project. This is the project which I am writing together with Richard Squire from Fordham uh, Law School. And from the title, Principal Cost, uh, you can guess that it is uh, going the opposite direction of the agency cost theory. Tw the people here from Israel knows that in like, 20 years ago I wrote a paper explaining all of corporate law through agency cost. So it took me 20 years to understand that I was wrong. And today I will try to explain to you why is that that uh, I was wrong and uh, it was a one-sided uh, story. Now, this project starts from the observation that when you think about dispersed ownership, corporations that do not have a control in owner, then there are many, many debates in the United States and the two camps are divided into what they call director supremacy and shareholder supremacy those who would like to give more power to the shareholders and those who would like to give more power to the board of directors. And it's all over the place, takeovers. Should boards be allowed to defend the corporation against a hostile bid? Hedge fund activism, should the board be allowed to stop the activism? Staggered boards, should the board be forced to uh, take away the staggered boards? Proxy access, and it's all over the place. Now, even though any piece of this discussion is all about allocation of control rights between the board and the shareholders, those discussions are being framed in terms of agency costs. Those who believe that management agency costs are high would like to empower shareholders. Those who believe that management agency cost is low would like to empower the board. On the other hand, when you look on the world, you do see that investor-owned firms allocate control in various ways between investors and management. On one hand, you have like dual class, then you have master limited partnership, concentrated ownership, private equity, dispersed ownership, hedge funds. Each has a different allocation of control rights. So agency cost cannot be the whole story. Even though I wrote that 20 years ago, it can't be. Because if it was right, and the issue was all about agency cost, if agency cost is the issue, we would see most companies along the lines on the left side focusing more toward direct democracy. If this is not a problem, then we'll see most corporations adopting dual class. So it must be something that is going on there, which is countering the effect of the agency cost problem. So this is the project. The project starts with the question, what determines the allocation of control rights in investor-owned firms? Now, the basic story is the following. If I have no knowledge whatsoever in managing money, and I will try to manage my own portfolio, obviously I will suffer loss because I will make many mistakes. My incompetence would lead me to make mistakes. Now, of course, I can go and study and quit my job and learn how to manage money and try to do that, but my opportunity cost is going to be high. So I will hire a money manager. If I hire a money manager, I enter into a principal and agent relationship. My hope is, of course, that even though I will suffer now agency cost because the agent might be dishonest or will do some other stuff that promote the interest of the agent, still whatever the agent is making money for me is more that I can do for myself. Now, when I make that decision to transfer the discretion or give control rights to the money manager, well, I know that there is this problem of agency cost and now I will try to think how I will hold the agent accountable. So I will hold some control rights in my hand. For example, I will have the right to fire the, in, the money manager at any day. So six months goes by and I see that my portfolio is underperforming. I go to the money manager and ask, what's, what's going on? Why is that that you are, not, you are underperforming? And the money manager, manager will explain to me carefully that he picked excellent shares and I said, it's only a matter of time, should be patient, and in six months we will beat the market. So two options. One option, that he's telling the truth, that he's talented and he's telling the truth. 
Another option is that he's lazy and dishonest and is just covering his failure with, with lies. But me trying to exercise the control right, I will face the same problem I had before, which is my incompetence to understand what's going on with selecting those shares. So I might either fire an excellent manager or I might keep a lousy manager in place. Either way, this is a mistake. So we see that there is here a tension between the mistakes that I can make and the mistakes that the agent can make or the conflict that the agent might have. So starting with the earlier work, the most famous work is, of course, Jensen and Macklin 1976 paper. For almost 40 years, agency cost theory is dominating corporate law. And their theory is about allocation of cash flow rights. In their model, there is a, an owner manager who will get an outside capital, but will keep 100% of control rights in the hands of the owner manager. So the agent has 100% of control rights. There is no division of control rights. The only thing that you divide is cash flow rights. So all shareholders have zero voting rights. Okay? Imagine that they have a dual class, and one class has no voting rights whatsoever. So that's the model. And we, of course, are interested in the more uh, uh, real thing, which is the allocation of control rights. So in their models, once you divided cash flow rights, then agents sharing cash flow rights with the principal leads to conflict, which leads to agents' takings. And takings is either diverting or shirking, or it's more what we can call either self-dealing or mismanagement. So the agency cost in this story is monitoring, bonding, and residual loss. So monitoring in their story, because there are no control rights, is just about enforcing a contract. Monitoring in their model is just the, let's say the, the agent made a commitment not to buy a private jet, and he did. So suing the agent in order to enforce the contract, that's the monitoring. So in their model, monitoring did not include any use of control rights. So all of this, was sold through a contract, was sold through pricing, and eventually it was the choice of the agent who was suffering from the agency cost to decide whether it's worthwhile for him to raise money and get the economies of scale. We start at the beginning in our project. Control has cost and benefits. Control benefits are, for, of course, the, the most important thing is creating pecuniary value. Every aspect of management and the attempt to create value requires control rights, whether strategic plans or day-to-day -day management, it all will involve control rights. And there is also some element which we call pleasure and which Ron Gilson defined as non-harmful, non-pecuniary benefits, which are different from Jensen and Mecklin that were talking about non-pecuniary benefits that were harmful to the corporation. On the other side, there are control costs. And they include competence. Remember, this was the first reason why I hired the money manager, and conflict cost. So competent costs are the cost of mistakes and the effort to avoid them, which includes expertise, information to make the decision, and the residual cost of mistakes. Obviously, we cannot avoid all mistakes. Conflict costs, much like Jensen and Macklin, includes the cost of takings and the effort to avoid them. It will include monitoring, but this time monitoring includes using control rights, meaning the ability to fire the agent as well, bonding, and the residual cost of takings. Once we have that, it is easy to see that there is a matrix two by two. Competence cost and conflict cost of the principal and the agent. And these represent elements I'm not going to focus on the conflict, they are very obvious. It could be conflict between the principal and the agent, and it also could be a conflict among the principals when you have a large group. But when you look on the competence cost, you see that it includes the expertise, the opportunity cost, objectivity, collective action problem, coordination problems. And when you think about the agent, then it will include the expertise, intellectual endowment, which is a nice way to say whether he's smart or stupid. Emotional endowment, which is a nice way to say whether it's crazy or reasonable person, whatever. But these are the elements. Now, the idea is that if you keep all control rights in the, in the hands of the principal, 
you will have to bear the cost of the two upper cells. Once you start delegating to the agent, you will start having the cost of the two lower cells. Earlier work, of course, treated those elements. Jensen and Macklin, of course, covered the right, but the lower right cell completely with defining the conflict cost of agents. And many others have added elements to that story. Conflict cuts of the principle were also identified, most notably Henry Hansman in his work on the ownership of the firm. But some others also mentioned that, like Marty Lipton with the short-termism. And many others, they have identified elements in the conflict part. Over the competence part, also some work has been done. The most famous one is Baron Means, that talked about the rational apathy of shareholders. Most recently, Gordon and Gilson, they talked about rational reticence of institutional investors. And very few work has been done on the agent competence. Now, the important thing to understand between these two is that when you think about the agent conflict, that's something that you can solve by giving the agent more cash flow, incentive, compensation package. But when you move to the agent competence, if the agent is stupid, it doesn't matter. You can give them as many options as you like. It's not going to help. So the only way to rectify the situation is by firing the agent, meaning using control rights. Control rights are crucial for the competence. You can use them for the conflict, but you can have alternative to deal with the conflict, which not necessarily require control rights. Now, in our story, the parties divide both control rights and cash flow rights. The division of control rights will determine the ability to manage and to take. The division of cash flow rights will determine the incentives to manage and to take. So the cash flow right division is the source of the conflict. And the division of control rights is the source of the competence cost. But of course, with, the contra co with control rights, you might exploit the conflict. So they are related to each other. One determine the capital structure, the other determine the governance structure. But the most important thing to realize is that this is a zero sum pro proposition. Whatever the law gives you, whatever amount of rights you have for a corporation, for any other entity, whatever rights are there, you can only divide them from 100% owned by the principal and as many that you would like to give to the agent. There is no more than that. Now, it creates a trade-off. And the trade-off is between principal's mistakes and takings and agent's mistakes and takings. And it means that the more control rights you will give to the agent, the higher the agent cost, the lower the principal cost. The more control rights you are going to give the principal, the higher the principal cost, and the lower the agent cost. And you cannot simultaneously minimize both principal cost and agent cost. Any change in the division of control rights will increase one type and decrease the other. So what the parties will do, they will aim at allocating control rights in a way that will minimize the sum of principal cost and agent cost. Meaning they will aim at minimizing mistakes and takings by the principal and the agent and the effort to avoid them. What does that, what that, that mean? So the probability and magnitude of agent mistakes and takings will be affected by the type of the agent, honest or crooked, type of the firm and the market, whether it's competitive or complex. So in some markets, when you make a mistake, the only thing that will happen is the rate of return will decrease. In some markets, if you make a mistake, mistake you will go bankrupt. So the, the effect of a mistake might be different. For the principle, the probability and magnitude of principles, mistakes, and takings is also affected by the type of the principle, individual or institution, the type of the firm and the market. And here, the important thing is to acknowledge that since the principal is monitoring the agent, it would depend the type of information that you can get from the corporation in order to figure out whether the agent is honest and effective or not. Sometimes if you rely on indirect proxies for effort, like stock market prices, and if stock market prices are not efficient or if the market is myopic, you might make mistakes in evaluating the performance of the agent. So the minimization point of control cost is firm specific. So if you think about zero delegation on the left side and 100% delegation on the right side, 
when you start increasing the delegation, principal costs start decreasing and agency costs start going up. In some firms, the sum of these two is going to be on high delegation end, like with dual class firms. In other firms, when you start moving over the delegation, principal cost goes down, but agency cost goes up much faster, and you are better off not delegating. It's like in a partnership. And in some firms, it's going to be somewhere in between, like in dispersed ownership, in which the agent and the principal are going to share control rights between them. In some way, shareholders will keep the ability to replace the board or intervene in some other element in the story. So what's the conclusion of that? The conclusion of that is that we should see this spectrum of investor-owned firms. Each one trying to minimize their own control cost, which is principal cost and agency cost, and we will see a spectrum along this line. Now, we have put all of them at the same height over principal cost and agency cost, but we do not claim that they all will reach the same amount when they are trying to minimize principal cost and agency cost. The only thing we would like to indicate by making this picture this way is that firms will minimize control cost efficiently, meaning that their cost of control is going to reflect the efficient allocation of efficient division of control rights. So if we would like to make a, a, a graph that will put them truly on it, it will be the cap M graph. Empirical prediction. Agency cost theory will predict that if you change ownership structure, it will affect firm performance. Okay, so if you increase the wedge between cash flow rights and control rights, you should see, you should see differences in firm performance. And indeed, some empirical studies like Mork, Schleifer and others have shown that you do see differences in performance when you change ownership structure. Principal cost theory predicts that you shouldn't see such a difference in firm performance. They should be the same. And there is a famous study by Dent and Land that supports that, that conclusion in terms of empirical findings. But there is also a study by Himmelberg, Hubbard, and Palia that went over the earlier studies, corrected them for some missing controls, and the effect that they have discovered all disappeared, as the principal cost theory would suggest you should see. So what's the implication for law? The implication for law, given the debates that we have over allocation of control rights, because it's not about cash flow rights, it's allocation of control rights, is that lawmakers, and when we say lawmakers, we mean courts, we mean regulators, we mean legislature, lawmakers should not take side in the debate over director supremacy versus shareholder supremacy. Especially not in a case like dispersed ownership, in which it is clear that they are sharing control rights. What they should do? Lawmakers should respect the chosen governance structure, whatever that, are, that is, concentrated ownership, dual class, dispersed ownership, whatever that's going to be. And the only thing that they should do, they should assist the parties to keep the sum of control cost low under changing circumstances. And I give just a few illustrations. And one of them is, of course, when you have a takeover which takes two days to complete what they call Saturday night special. You make the tender offer on Saturday night and you want the approval by Monday. That's exploiting shareholders. That's increasing principal costs with no countering benefit. So the William Acts that required 20 business days is appropriate. When you have a coercive dual class offer, the Unical rule is appropriate because it reduces principal costs which do not have any countering benefit on the other side. Thank you very much. <laughs>